So unfortunately today, uh, can't show a few of the rooms. We've got about a dozen people here and about uh, 10 people or so on, uh, on Zoom. Thank you all for coming. Um, today, we've got uh, Councillor Andrew Davenport here, who's uh, graciously um, agreed to come and look at the goings on here and what we're doing with the, with the rooms here and uh, our uh, community engagement and all that good stuff. Um, he'll uh, have a few words after uh, our uh, first speaker, um, Ian, VK3 uh, BUF, who will be talking about uh, HF uh, interference from the NBN, uh, something that a few people, especially those who have uh, VDSL for their uh, NBN, have, uh, have, can have issues with. So I think that means um, we'll just hand it over to Ian. Well, good evening all anyway. And uh, it's Ian here, BK3BUF, and uh, I'm located a little out of town in Drill West at the moment. And I'm one of the, the, the two people who were involved with the QRM Guru website, which is put up to control and hopefully help people to eliminate their interference problems. And uh, the other one being Chris, who's there blinking on and off in the background. Very good. There's a wave, a short wave. And uh, well, what we wanted to look at here tonight was in particular interference that was coming from a lot of people's uh, NBN systems. In general, I'll just start with uh, what the situation is but as amateurs. We've got our HF radios, we've got our antennas, and uh, any noise that's going around the location where we live is going to be picked up to a, a larger or smaller degree. And, and this is a problem. And if you're trying to listen to signals uh, out of the noise, then you've got to try and get that noise level as low as you can. Now, everything contributes to it. And domestically, where there's more and more things around us which create that mess we can have some power line noise uh, buzzing up and down the street that could be uh, providing specific interference on some of the HF bands. We can have uh, bad LED lighting either in our own homes um, or in the homes of our neighbors. And uh, at Christmas time, everyone gets their Chinese Christmas lights out of the box and throws them up over the trees and over the mantelpiece. And a lot of those have dreadful power supplies and the, uh, the noise level for the amateurs in a neighborhood can uh, um, hit S9 and you won't be hearing anything until uh, uh, New Year's Day when people start to put their decorations again, away again. And in the middle of all of that, there's um, garage door openers, roller door controls and spa heaters. There's all kinds of appliances. But what has, has come to pass, and there's kind of a good and bad thing here, we used to uh, have problems with amateurs interfering with television. Now, when it was on the VHF bands and a little on the UHF, that was always a thing. If we're transmitting, it was hard to try and keep it out of people's receivers. A lot of people, are they've gone digital now, they've gone a bit further up the spectrum and uh, interference to TVs seems to be mostly a thing of the past. But, but we've got a lot of modems in our homes now and this is where it comes to it. So NBN have done fibre to the node or fibre to the house and stuck a nice little uh, uh, box in our houses and they radiate. This is, a, this is a big issue. Now, it's to do with more and more speed. If we're going to be getting internet connections with more speed and more bandwidth, they've got to enter further up to the spectrum. Uh, compression only gets you so far. Uh, lots of square waves and they start radiating. And uh, we've had a number of people who have sent messages to us on the QRM Guru website talking about this type of interference, where they, they just turn a radio on and it's, the S meter is just hard across and it's uh, just showing lots and lots of noise. And if they can go to the trouble of turning their NBN modem off, it falls right back again. So it's, it's definitely a culprit. But with an NBN system, uh, there are, there's a couple of pieces to the puzzle because there's a data going into the system and that can be using the, the, the cables that go into the system can be radiating, not if it's um, uh, fiber optic right into the modem, but for a lot of us, 
it's only fiber to the node up the street and there's still a bit of wire from the street corner to the NBN modem in the house and that can be radiating. Then there's the box itself. How well shielded is that? Um, a lot of them aren't too bad. Internally, they, they have applied shielding, but that's only as good as the ins and the outs. The, the next thing is um, these NBN modems usually are powered. So there's a plug pack, which is gonna go into the wall with a three pin outlet and they can radiate through that power line, the power lead. So that's another possibility. And of course, then there's the output side. If you're just running Wi-Fi, there won't be an obvious output side, but many of us are running uh, hardwire connections to the backs of TVs um, or local networks or switches and, and away you go. All in all, they radiate badly and uh, it can be quite hard to shut up. So it's, it's a little difficult. You've got to try and be a bit systematic if you're trying to knock it down. And on the QRM Guru website, we do have a process and it's, it's actually good to start with the beginning process. First of all, you've got to make sure it's coming from it and not your neighbor's modem or some such source. The obvious point being, if you can unplug it and it goes away, then that's probably the cause. Um, but there is a process and uh, we've got to find out what, what is doing it. Uh, is it happening all of the time? Is it only happening um, when there's a peak demand or when a particular appliance is drawing from the network? Um, these things can add up. So try and detail much of this as possible, make some notes. And if you uh, have to refer back to it or consult with someone else, that saves a lot of mucking around. But all right, let's just supposing you've turned on your, your radio, you've got lots of, uh, lots of noise, you've got your NBN modem in the next room and it seems to be making noise. Well, the, the biggest trick we can do that seems to help the most is if you do use um, some ferrite suppressions. Now, just to expand on that, what is ferrite? Uh, ferrite's kind of a composite material. It looks like a metal or it looks like a ceramic. It's, um, it's iron oxides, it's compressed, it's got trace elements in it, and then it's been molded into a shape of the epoxies. But what's most important is it will absorb radio frequencies a certain range of radio frequencies depending on the type of a ferrite device that it, that it is. Now, these can be used in lots of different ways. There's small ones, um, just like the one I'm holding up here, which is, I don't know if you can see that, that's a little clamp unit. And you can uh, put that around a cable and close it up and it'll click uh, until you've just got a clamp over a cable. And you can put several of those on a cable. Um, we've done a lot of tests and uh, this with ferrites on the QRM Guru website, there are some videos. And one of the things that highlights is that if you've just got a single wire passing through a ferrite, um, here's a wire, is what I prepared earlier. If you've got a single wire and you just pass it through once, that will get rid of some of the signal, but not a lot. It's usually not enough. You might need multiple ferrites on there. If your clamp is big enough to put more than one turn through and you can still close it, then that gives you a multiplication effect. One extra turn through that clamp is the equivalent of using basically four ferrites. It's uh, that much difference. So the more turns you can fit into whatever ferrite device you're using, the more it's going to work. So what's actually happening is that the low frequencies, the power that's feeding the cable will pass through unchanged, the high frequencies will get absorbed in the ferrite material. Uh, there are, the larger rings are, are okay. And sometimes if you can get a, a plug through, yeah, that helps, you can wind it through. But quite often things are permanently attached and you can't get them through. Uh, so that's when we use the, the big guns, you can actually get very large ferrites, one big enough to pass a power plug through. And if you can get a few turns through like that, the attenuation effect is huge. That will stop anything from the power supply going through. If you can uh, unplug the lead where it goes into your motor as it comes into the house and get uh, three or four turns on one side and three or four turns on the other, that's really going to knock around that signal. And of course, we have to do the same on the output side where the cables leave the uh, modem and go into a switch or into another device best to try and get it close to the source as you can. And while you're doing this, keep an eye on the S-meter and, and see what the reaction is. Maybe you, you put something on and okay, it knocks it back a few S points. That means you're getting warm, it means you can stick a few more on and keep on taking it down. 
it's, it's very hard to, to, to eliminate it entirely. There is a very good case study with photographs on QRM Guru where um, this has been done and it's turned the whole system around. You can, in an extreme case, you can go back to the supplier and say, well, this modem is terrible. If you've got another brand, I can try. And uh, perhaps you'll have more, uh, more luck with a different brand of modem if you just can't knock it out. You might try shielding it. You might put the whole thing in a metal box and try and ground that box, which, of course, is not going to help your Wi-Fi. <laughs> it's going to uh, kill that. Uh, so, look, there's a whole bunch of different strategies, and it's a matter of sneaking up on it and uh, trying to, to uh, deal with the problem. But um, interference in general has become part of our hobby and i think this is something that we've all got to come to terms with now but if you're into amateur radio and you've bought your your radios your antennas you've got your license and everything's all looking good and you turn your radio on and there's noise you, you really don't have much of a hobby if you can't hear anyone and uh, uh, the ability to track down that noise through a process decide what's what's coming from where and what you can do about it is is all part of it and uh, uh, it's actually a bit of a community thing as well, because if it turns out the noise is coming from a neighbour, for example, a couple of doors up, uh, they might have a whole bunch of really cheap LED lights and they're wiping you out, then have a discussion with them, even maybe come to the party with helping them out with to replace those with cleaner ones. A, a lot of the LED lights that come from Bunnings now have been uh, proven to be very clean and uh, uh, that's solving a lot of problems. But uh, do that as an exercise and let them know in doing so that they're going to be helping themselves because if something is generating noise, fundamentally it's not right. We've also found that things that generate noise like battery chargers are at risk of um, catching fire because that means that they're, uh, they're not switching correctly. There are issues and we've actually found test cases where battery chargers have been about to catch fire when they've been caught, crazy, caught creating interference uh, and they were tracked down and they've helped neighbors. So it all comes together. Uh, if you do help a neighbour to reduce their interference, they will find that their, their Wi-Fi in their house to their phone and to their appliances will improve as well. So it's, it's a community problem. We feel it more than most, but everyone feels it a little bit and getting the interference down is, uh, is a big issue. Um, so it's a, it's a huge topic and we could talk for hours, but we're not going to. And uh, I can pause for a, a couple of questions if there are any. And or uh, you can pop up in the chat and, and post a message if you want to. Uh, what I do suggest is even if you're just going for a bit of a look, um, you can sit behind me. There's a, uh, a banner and it says qrm.guru. That's the, um, the website address. Plug that in. You'll see a search engine which asks you to put in any clue about any problems you might have. It might be NBN. It might be solar power. It might be LED lighting and you'll find a whole bunch of articles and discussion items and video clips that are related to those problems. So that's a really good starting point uh, that will, will walk you through the process. Uh, this is something I might add too that has become important to the ACMA because they don't have a lot of resources for tracking down interference anymore. And that's a political thing, but uh, it's, a, it's a reality. So that if, there, if you do have an issue, you can't just say, ring up the ACMA and say, I've got a noise problem, come and fix it. It's not going to happen. You're going to have to uh, uh, deal with it yourself for most part, or if you can't deal with it, you're going to have to present a case of facts to the ACMA so that they can have a look at it. Uh, so there's details on the website on how to prepare yourself to uh, escalate a problem if you can't deal with it yourself. So um, it's all part of it. And uh, yeah, don't be afraid to have a look. Uh, I saw a comment there from Martin. Uh, you've said you've had a look at the site, which is very good. Uh, micro inverter systems. Uh, yes, that's actually a very good one. And we do have some experience. One of the, uh, the, the RASA committee members has a solar system on the roof of his two-story home, which had a whole bunch of micro inverters. And each one has its own noise signature. And when the sun shines, his noise floor goes berserk. Every single one of them. Uh, makes a mess. So if you have the opportunity to, to avoid micro inverters, um, please do so. It seems to have a multiplying effect. Every, like noise in a room, um, every single item just adds to the noise floor. And when you've got a whole bunch of micro inverters, uh, maybe they've been grounded properly, maybe they haven't, but each one is just uh, 
adding to the noise. Um, so not a fan. Oh, we've got one question from the audience, I think. Okay. Uh, thanks for your talk. It's Mark VK3MD. Um, I have interference at home, basically up to 50 megahertz. Um, and then it tails off and generally it's good by 144. Um, when the antenna is pointing, if I'm doing meteor scatter, it sort of points more towards the power lines and a little bit away from the house. Um, but how can I tell if there is something in the house compared to if it's external, the neighbor's house or the power lines? Oh, really good question. Uh, thanks, Mark. The, the first thing is <laughs> I would recommend is put the radio on a battery and kill the power in the house and see if it goes away. I mean, that's, um, uh, it seems a little bit obvious, but it's actually a really good one. It's a bit disruptive to, to everyone in the house, so don't do it if people are watching their favourite programmes. But, okay, yeah, set up your HF rig, your uh, whatever it might be, uh, which is normally on a power supply. Try and set it up on a battery. Uh, then throw the big switch. And if you have a solar inverter system on the home, uh, throw that one as well. Do them one at a time so that you can measure the difference and see if it goes away. Uh, if it persists, then it's not coming from your house, it's coming from somewhere else. The next step is to look at the time domain. Is it there all of the time? Is it there at certain times of the day? And if there's a relationship with daylight, it might be solar oriented. If it's a relationship with the evenings, it might be when people are it's getting dark enough for people to turn their lights on. In the case of power lines, it's a little bit harder because if you've got a faulty join in a power line on a pole on a cross arm and it's radiating or there's some corona discharge and it is clubbering your home, it will go for quite some distance. The actual fault might be half a kilometer away. But here's a bit of a trick that's worth noting is the further you go up the spectrum, the more local the interference tends to become. So what I would suggest you do, you said you were hearing it um, typically uh, covering HF and tapering off uh, maybe a little bit about 50 meg to the point where it's not upsetting two meters. If you've got a handheld that can uh, is a general coverage handheld and you can build one of those little DF loop devices or even if you're just using the rubber duck in the worst case, uh, keep on going up the band until the interference starts to drop off. Then do a bit of a walk around and if it comes back again go further up the band. The closer you get to the source, the higher up the spectrum, the noise will be coming. And uh, so if, if you've just got your handheld set to uh, 80 meters, uh, you're gonna be doing a lot of walking and you're just going to hear it everywhere and you're not gonna be quite sure where it's coming from. Uh, I, I don't know if any of those tips help you. Once again, they are laid out on the website, but uh, that's the basic process, uh, Mark, uh, over to you. That's really helpful, thanks for that, uh, Ian. Um, I'll take that on board and uh, I have turned off the solar inverter and had no change at all. So, uh, but I haven't turned off the whole house. So I might try that next. And as you say, try um, just above 50 megahertz and walk up the street under the power lines if it gets higher or something. So yeah, I do have another quick question though. I've been using those beads um, to try and, uh, how do I say, I've got a fox hunting antenna and I'm trying to um, stop the coax from being part of the antenna and I've been using those. And as I clip one on, it makes some improvement. My hand has less effect on the coax. Um, so I noted that you wrapped it around there and you said it was like the equivalent of four beads, which is really interesting. So I might try that, it might be better. Um, you were saying the material is important. So what material should we be looking out for? In my case, I'm building a six meter antenna. Okay, most of the uh, material that you get will be what they call, the most common one is type 43. These ones are all type 43 and they're pretty good. Um, there's a type 31 which uh, has uh, very good effects down at, at HF frequencies. The type 43 go a little bit higher. Uh, but what I've, I've noticed, because I've tried some experiments with these, by the time you start piling the turns on, with whatever type of ferrite it is. By the time you start piling the turns on either this, either this or the ring, it, it seems in my observations to matter less and less of what the material is and more of how much you've got protected. So uh, 
I guess it's a matter of doing what's expedient first, get a hold of whatever uh, ferrite clamps and beans you can and give them as many turns as you can. Um, yeah, oh, one, one further comment too, on turning off your power in the house. I'll just mention that in, in uh, capping off the other topic. Uh, don't just turn everything off with a big clunk. If you can go to your switchboard, turn things off one sector at a time, that's better than turning things on one sector at a time. And I say this because quite often the interference in a home doesn't manifest until after the appliance is warmed up. So have everything running and you've got the interference and then turn things off one at a time and, and see at what point the interference goes. It might be a plug pack on a wall in the next room for all you know. Um, but yes, turning stuff off sequentially is actually better than turning them on sequentially. So there's a little tip. Great, thanks very much. Thank you, Mark. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Ian. Um, great talk as always. And we might have a little bit more chat um, afterwards if you're sticking around. I'll stick um, around for a while, yep. Wonderful. So for now, um, we'll have uh, Councillor Andrew Davenport from uh, the White Horse Council, um, who we rent the rooms from, not from him personally, but from the council. Good evening, all. Um, I'd like to welcome Councillor Andrew Davenport um, from the City of Whitehorse. Um, he's been active in the city, and I've pinched some stuff from websites and things here, so just... Uh, if I may indulge for a moment. Um, Andrew's been active with the City of Whitehorse for some 14 years and re-elected as our local councillor in 2020 for the Wattle Ward, which is actually this particular area, of which I think we've got about five members in this little district, ward, if you like. Andrew's an engineer with further qualifications in law and business administration and is active with a number of local clubs, including football, Lions and Rotary, but not yet amateur radio. In particular, we welcome him uh, to our recently refurbished meeting space, especially our new uh, kitchen, um, bathrooms and, and this butte carpet that we're hoping to keep as clean as it is. Um, the committee recently agreed to extend an invitation to Councillor Davenport as a way to not only say thanks to Council, but also to demonstrate our own contribution to the building. As you can see, the, the painting and uh, the IT infrastructure that is growing as we uh, progress. Um, so we're trying to make it into a great and active space for members and for those interested in the amateur radio hobby. As you can see, it's come a long way from the old and very tired Scout Hall that placed this club some 20, of 250 odd members has been associated with in some way, shape, form uh, since mid 2008. So we've been around for a little while in this building. But importantly, I've, I've done a little research because I'm sure Andrew's done some research on us. <laughs> <laughs> so I note from uh, Councillor Davenport's CV on the City of Whitehorse website, and I think we can tick a few boxes of some of the um, items of his particular interest as noted on the website. And I say that, for example, improving amenities across Whitehorse. Now, just have a look what we've done here. So I think we've got a tick there. Protecting the neighbourhood character. And then these are not in your order, Andrew, but I'll... Oh, well, well, we're going to paint them green. <laughs> so we've protected the neighbourhood character because this place has its own character and we've maintained that as best we can. Um, enhancing parks, gardens and cycling infrastructure. Well, I know there are a few around here who will tell you that we do pick up the doggy do from the park and put it in the bin. Um, increasing library services. Now, nobody would deny that we've got an extensive and growing library downstairs. <laughs> uh, delivering sound financial management. Now, I'm pretty sure Andrew will confirm that we do manage to pay our council dues on time. In fact, our treasurer will probably say, I think we're in, in credit at the moment, uh, but enough of that. Um, delivering sound financial management. Yes, well, that's where we were. Reducing the cost of living. Well, later on tonight, you will see that we have cheap coffee, but tonight we've spent up big on the good bickies. <laughs> Encouraging female participation in sport. Now, you might say this is an amateur radio sport. It certainly is in some aspects. We have, 
Yeah, we have a few female members, um, but none here tonight, but we'd welcome more. And there are some very active um, female amateurs in the fraternity. Promote continuous improvement culture. Well, we do provide training from foundation, advancing through to advanced within our organisation. And the last one that I'll vouch for is that defending elderly services. Now, what can I say? Considering our demographic is approaching 60, I think we're doing a great job. But the final one is that at this point, I'm still working on Andrew's point of cutting business red tape. Now, I'm not sure that we've done so much in that area, but we'd love to. <laughs> so great to have you here, Andrew. Thank you. Welcome. And uh, look forward to hearing from you. No worries at all. Thank you very much. Thanks, David. Well, thank you for that introduction, uh, David. And before I, I kick off, I'll make sure that people on Zoom can, can hear me okay, because I, I won't be looking at the screen. I'm getting the thumbs up. So that's that's good. Well, it's very, um, very pleased to be here tonight um, and uh, see a repurposed scout hall being uh, used um, by your club, because at the city of Whitehorse, we do think about what to do with what we call privately constructed buildings. And a lot of these scout halls were privately constructed and then council has been trying to repurpose um, halls over time. And I do understand from David that uh, your club is the sole user of this facility. And I, and I know that there are surrounding um, organizations like the Astronomical Society of Victoria that meet at Paris Street that's looking for other premises. Other premises? Yep, okay. And um, and there's, there's probably a few other groups. So uh, David, if you can point me in the direction of the appropriate member for your committee, maybe other groups can um, be part of this particular hall and help spread the cost amongst multiple user groups. Uh, and what we try and do with uh, council is uh, upgrade the facilities that we have. So uh, we have a, a, a capital works program where a couple of the privately constructed buildings are upgraded um, or at least refurbished on a certain cycle. And it's based on the condition of the facility itself. And so the works for the bathrooms in the kitchen and the carpet is part of that council um, budget allocation. Now, in one way, being a councillor is sort of a little bit easier because I always like to keep the rates quite low and the state governments put a cap. So the arguments of the past on how much of a rate rise would, would be is sort of disappeared but it means a council can now concentrate on becoming more efficient in its operations to be able to maintain um, a healthy amount of, of surplus, not profit, but that's used for our capital work programs um, and renewing of our assets. Now, when, uh, I don't live that far away from this particular hall. I walked here today. And um, when I was thinking about what I'd talk about, I, I thought, I talk a little bit about when I was younger, when I was um, in ventures in scouts, uh, because that was just prior to the uh, mobile phone coming out, or I should say the mobile phone being cheap enough to, for the ordinary person like myself to afford. Um, and, and so as ventures, um, we used to use the uh, UHF CB radio. And uh, I also had the benefit of being able to what I would call reverse engineer a, a, a Yagi beam antenna. Um, so measuring it up and cutting the aluminium tubes and the, yes, the elements, well, I called it out the tubing and then the, the beam element and then, and then uh, connecting it up to the coax. So um, although that was not amateur radio, that was a citizen band, there was a little bit of, um, uh, how would you say, it? more more than just buying things off the shelf when, um, when I was younger. And it was something that amateur radio appealed to me when I was younger, and I started to research it, but I got a bit scared off at the time because of the Morse code component. But I understand that that's re that requirement has reduced 
and it's now gone. Well, that's that's um, pleasing to hear. So let's let's see let's see how I go uh, at the end of my council term to see if uh, to see how I go in amateur radio after that point in time because council is quite quite busy at the moment. Um, I'll talk a little bit about council generally and what's going on if you'd like. It's, it's most people here from the city of Whitehorse area or around. Then I'm going to keep it quite broad. So quite a, at the moment, local government's going through the council rate rates and budget. Every council is doing that, Whitehorse and Monash. And that's where clubs like yourself can give feedback to the budget. So if you're wanting additional work done to the, this particular facility, then if you make a submission, I'll keep an eye out for it. Um, in terms of clubs like yourself, you would get the ability to put in what we call community grants. So funding for certain types of activities. Um, during the COVID time, uh, I know that we had a program where any user of our halls and facilities basically had um, their uh, utility bills wiped. I'm not sure if you got that grant. You did? It's coming. That's good. And that was something that we did as, as councillors because we recognised that when, the, when community groups couldn't meet, then we should help with that and reduce that cost burden for the group. And I was very pleased that we were able, able to do that. So uh, I think um, I'll ask if there's any questions generally that you might have of me, because I don't want to be here and talk about things you may not be interested in. I'd much rather you ask me a question and then I can give you an answer, whether it's about um, my involvement in uh, council or the other groups that have been uh, mentioned. Um, but uh, I'd like to uh, thanks for the, thank you for the opportunity to come and, and see your facilities here. Um, you're more than welcome to uh, let me know how I should do my job better. And I will take all of your comments as a gift. So thank you, David. I'm going to ask you, is there any questions? Yeah. You know, I can't remember the last time that I've had a planning application that's been contentious that's, that's to do with an antenna. So at council, I'll, I'll let you know what, what happens with planning. If you have more than 12 people that are complaining, then planning matters come to the councillors for a determination. Now, I can't remember a time where I've had one like that it might be where there's been complaints and then an officer has basically said said no to it but have you had a bad experience at council uh, not so much in my own property but i have to uh, take care of my own house and my house and then we have to take care of my own house right in white horse yeah. uh, you, uh, send me some more details about about that now, my email address is on the council website and you're more than welcome to reach out and I'll, I'll find out a bit about it because for me, it's not, it's not um, something that's been on, been raised to my level as being an issue generally. And it's very rare to have a council officer roaming in the parks because more, I get more complaints about council not enforcing people that bring their dogs out there and do their droppings and walk off. Yeah, fair enough. Well, if you let me know a bit more, I'll, I'll see I'll see about it. All right. Yep. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Um, 
I'll just see if there's any more questions or comments or potentially from the uh, from the Zoom. Right. Did Not you want, entirely did you want... sure what, what Martin's question is there. Could you uh, could you uh, make that a little bit more concrete? Yeah, just right, jump let in. me let me hand you the microphone. There's um, I can tell you now that if you go out the door, turn left to the first tree. Uh, there's regularly blue bags of droppings bag. At least they're bagged. That's a good start. But stuff gets dropped up the driveway as well. That's what I think Mark is, um, Martin, I should say, is referring to. Um, it, it Actually, it's an interesting one, and it's a bit of a story, but once upon a time, we had a large recycle bin here because it didn't really fit in here. We used to leave it outside the door, and, of course, it get filled up with goodness knows what. And, um, and then it get, won't get taken because it's not got recycling in it and then it became a problem. So we got ourselves a smaller one, which we keep inside now. Um, so the doggy do just goes out here by the tree. So, you know, I don't know. I did mention to somebody about putting a, a doggy do bin out there, but I think it was a bit far from where the truck goes past or something. So I don't know. Yeah. Anyway, something well, maybe to consider. Yeah, well, thank you for that. Um, so in terms of uh, council's um, bins, so we do have a number of bins around the municipality that's based on where we find problem, basically problem areas. Um, council has tried not to put bins in parks. Um, it, it is a vexed issue within council and councillors as, as well, because I always say if someone wants a bin, a, much better there than just thrown everywhere because at least at least you've got one place to go pick up rubbish rather than just a general litter. Um, but what I what I can do is uh, take the request to the offices and see if we've got spare um, capacity for a, another bin, um, either in the park area or around here somewhere, and um, see what I can get done. If you did write it in as a budget submission, which is open right now, that would be very helpful for me because it means that it means that the officers have to respond, and it means I can challenge that response. Um, and I, I see the comment with regards to council's response to dump rubbish. Uh, what I can talk about is um, there's an app that's available on a mobile phone. It's called Snap. Send solve. Yep. And council's got a rule. So I start with graffiti. Graffiti, if someone takes a photo of it, it's meant to be gone within 48 hours. That's our general policy work. The only time when that doesn't happen is that I know of is at Gardner's Creek, you know, near the, the skate park. There's a wall of industrial, um, industrial complex there that because as soon as we remove it, it's tagging again. So we just, we, we have it on a set removal program. But it's the same with dump rubbish. Um, if, if there is rubbish that's there, um, five years ago, we, we, we um, arranged for an extra like dump truck just to pick up dump rubbish around and also um, extra, extra education and enforcement. So we're trying to keep on top of that. It's not perfect, especially in the more in the past around Deakin, where international students and others in that area, um, not just international students, but when there was a turnover of apartments, we found it was usually at the end of the semester and people, people were traveling. Um, there's a lot of dump, ru dump rubbish at the time, um, but we're, we're hoping we can get on top of that. One other one, Andrew, if I might. Um, there is an issue that um, is within the club. We have several members, and I mentioned earlier, um, who are wheelchair bound, um, and access to the toilets here are impossible, and access to this hall, indeed, is also impossible. Um, I often see notes come through from council saying, look, there is an opportunity to bid for this piece of Capital Works, for example, 
um, and they talk about the sports fields and, you know, new uniforms and new cricket bats and football, goal posts, whatever, which really, as you would know, is none of that's applicable to us, although is it applicable? And the other thing, it's all very well to me, for me to hold, or us to hold up a hand and say we want some sort of disabled toilet solution. But I think what we really need is somebody to say, well, that's possible if we do this why don't you bid for that? So I just need a name of a person who we can have that conversation with so that rather than just sticking up a flag and not knowing where it's going to go, somebody to talk to. Is there somebody that we could do, approach? So, yeah, it's a, it's a good question because uh, councils, in a, it, it is in a little bit of an interesting position because as soon as you touch a certain part of a building, you've got to make that, DDA compliant and that's why probably the case at the moment that the outer hasn't been touched because as soon as you do then it then you need to bring up to the uh, a certain building code for that that part of upgrade work um, but it is a thing that we look at quite often in terms of DDA compliance because one of the cornerstones of council is to make sure we've got um, our facilities that are suitable for people of all abilities and, and it's something that um, the council or as a cohort, myself and my colleagues take quite seriously. So if you're asking the best way forward, um, if you're going to write an, a little budget submission about, about um, various matters for us to consider, I would put this one on the list because that would certainly get the attention of a number of the councillors. I don't think that there would be many budget submissions this year. It's closing in another week and a bit. That means that the 10 council and 11 councillors now would, would certainly look at your submission and I'll, I'll keep an eye on it. So if you can make, if you can make a budget submission and then also um, I can get you the details of the, um, we've got, um, people in council, like in buildings and works, that um, will be able to look at the matter that's raised. All right. Thanks for that. Thank you very much, Andrew. Uh, anything? Any other questions, comments? Uh, yes. Uh, can Can Andrew hear me? Yes, I can. Okay. Um, hello, Andrew. Uh, as a former council employee of 20 years, it's great to see you again. And uh, thank you very much for coming tonight. And uh, hopefully in, in time, when you have a, a bit more free time, you can uh, get on the air and we'll be able to hear you. So um, thanks again for coming. Uh, not, not a problem at all. Thank you. Thank you very much, Russ. And we've got Chef over here. Councillor, thanks for uh, your presentation tonight. Good to hear, and we'll uh, be scribing something up in the next few days to submit to you for your uh, council consideration in terms of helping some of our other members. Um, just an absolute left field one. How's the progress on the new theatre complex going over the back, and what's the finish date? Yeah, it's a it's a good question. That's um, it's probably one of our bigger capital work items. Uh, at council, uh, the works are progressing quite well. I think we that the it's meant to be completed um, for the twenty twenty three season. Um, I think they said it was about an eighteen month build program. Um, now, the best place to get up-to-date information about the program itself is if you go to our council website on Whitehorse Centre, um, I think it's dot, I think it's dot com dot au, but I normally just go to the council website, whitehorse.vic.gov.au and I just search Whitehorse Centre updates. Um, but it is progressing quite well. Um, the, the base is in, they're now starting to put the walls up um, the car park is now has been completed for some period of time, and I think it will become available. Um, as I said, that I think they said the twenty twenty three season, but let's see what let's see what happens. We picked that supplier because they were uh, their build time was a lot faster than the other 
the supplier and um, the pricing was a bit better as well. And I won't, I won't co comment on the pricing or the business case because it does, uh, when I'm trying to reduce, reduce cost, that was a big capital outlay. No worries. Uh, one question, if you've got time. It's yes, Ian yes, here. Uh, yes, I, of course, with a, a club like EMDRC, having some publicity is always very important. I think there's probably a lot of people in the Shire there who don't even know that there's an amateur radio club that's active. And uh, I know most council areas, and probably yours as well, has got to sign up as people enter the region, showing what groups are, are active in the in the area, sporting clubs, Rotary and so forth. Uh, is there uh, anything up there for the uh, Eastern Mountain District Club? So if I look around the city, um, we, we wouldn't have those notice boards that you mentioned. I, I know the notice boards that you mentioned, it's essentially when I, if I'm on a big road trip and I go up, go up the Hume or um, up, up uh, towards Sydney and you come into a, 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 a town or an area and it will say what, what meets there. If I look at Whitehorse, I haven't seen such a sign for a long time. Um, I think uh, m most people, when I ask, when people ask me what groups meet in Whitehorse, I always direct them to our Whitehorse community directory. So, if you, if you, I suggest you have a look at that directory and get your details up to date in that um, Whitehorse community directory, and you can also see the other community groups that meet right nearby. Um, what I find quite often. Um, is that there's a lot of similar aims with the number of groups that I see, but there's, but I wish that there was a lot more talking from one group to another. Fair answer. All right. Thank you very much, Andrew. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you for the opportunity today. And I'm, I'll, I'll stay around at the end. And I'm, I'm sure if if you want to help me with pointers, I've got some takeaways on planning for the antennas, uh, items for the facility here. Um, but if there's anything else that you'd like me to take away, please mention it to me after the meeting. Thank you. Yes. Stay here. Okay. Sorry, just, just another minute. Um, so thank you very much for your... Uh, your presentation, your talk, and uh, coming here. Uh, I'm just getting on the camera here, I think. Yep, I am on camera. Um, for every speaker who comes here, um, for one, we're very happy to hear that we may have another future prospective amateur uh, here. And um, I'd like to present you a little banner from us. Thank you. Um, as a uh, memento and as a sign of our appreciation. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. And thank you for everything. No worries. Thank you very much for the presentation. Thank you. <laughs>